Welcome to Plato's Cave. I'm Jordan Myers, and I'm a master's student in philosophy at the University of Houston. You're listening to a reading group episode of the show, which means that in this episode, I discuss political philosophy with two non-philosopher friends, Adam and Giffen, because philosophy shouldn't just be for philosophers. So with that introduction, please enjoy our discussion of political philosophy. We're starting a new series on political theory, political philosophy. Uh, I, you know, it's kind of open ended. We don't have a game plan for it, but this is um, this is somewhat of a bridge paper between the moral responsibility stuff that we've been doing and the political theory that we're kind of moving into. Uh, this is a this. So we're going to do a paper <clears throat> called uh, Conflicts as Property by Nils Christie. Uh, it was published in the British Journal of Criminology in 1977. So it's a very old paper, but <laughs> it started off, it kind of was the, um, it was kind of the the introduction point or kind of the, the launching pad for a movement called restorative justice. And there was two, we watched uh, two videos on restorative justice that I'll link to as well as the paper in the description below. But um what uh, uh so just okay kind of because we haven't talked about this what we think about about the paper first impressions before we get into it because i have mixed feelings I, I i would say i do as well um i like the concept in theory but i don't agree with all the practices or yeah. implementation that she describes like it's very rudimentary at the end um mm. and she and she kind of acknowledges that fact yeah um, i think it's yeah. a he it's, it's a he nils is a he obviously <laughs> okay no, I, I googled the name and i i'm pretty I think, sure it's a male figure i think the last name christy probably throws you off there yeah yeah Maybe. I, 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 I guess so um let me just double check you know what's funny though is i actually found myself kind of ref- like when i was thinking about like well she doesn't do this like i actually thought it, it's a oh, feminine really? philosophy in the feminine voice too yeah <laughs> No, I, okay, I, that way I, do. I don't. I don't know. I guess. I guess the, the Google name images, and I guess just kind of their writing style. Kind of. Uh, there was something. Yeah, it was like a very Susan Wolf writing style. I don't know. Well, no, actually, because Wolf is. I mean, there's no comparison to, to Wolf. Well, I should have googled the author anyway. <laughs> but wait, so, Giffen, did, did you? So we're it confirmed. Nils Christie is a is a man. I, I don't want to make heavy assumptions, but Google Images would seem to agree. Okay, <laughs> yeah. So okay, Nils Nils, I'm assuming is a he. So with that important provide because you like the truth of his work really hinges on that. <laughs> the pronouns are pretty critical here. Yeah. No, but I, I'm I, I I should have googled Nils. Yeah. Okay, but I mean I either way here. Um, yeah, I mean I I liked I liked the concept. I thought that I've actually never heard of this concept before. Um, So it definitely added kind of like a new perspective to types of justice that can be, can be implemented. So yeah, Yeah. I had only vaguely been familiar with restorative justice, um, but from what I had, Oh, you had heard of it before this. (laughs) very very vaguely like okay. it was a phrase that i would probably be able to like you know <laughs> nod at but that, not much more than that <laughs> <laughs> but um like i so i have heard it maybe watched a youtube video or something along that line right like mm-hmm. not not heavy no heavy interest for sure um but this i mean i think i mentioned it uh in the chat but i it kind of betrayed my expectations um if you <laughs> I don't know. I, I was definitely have mixed feelings on this, um, both yeah. the content and like the writing style. Um, yeah, I have a lot of marks <clears throat> in places where I'm like, what on earth just happened in the in the preceding two sentences? <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. So, but overall, I, it's definitely a thinker. Um, it, it suggests <laughs> I, I thought it was kind of interesting because, well, we can get into it, um, the details, but just the way he presents it also is kind of like almost with i don't want to say with shame but with great hesitation um he hedges so so many aspects of this like he says like this is nothing more than like a framework and several times he's like i have not thought this far through um but and then like i thought it was very odd just the way because it seems to be so foundational um and even uh from what we had uh some of the supplementals you sent 
like the cores there were kind of almost buried in this uh, paper. Well, to, to be fair, like I, I kind of, I mean, it would be actually kind of weird. And I wonder if the paper would have been as popular had he actually given like a policy prescriptive. Because this is like, because I mean, it, you know, both of you already pointed out and you're right to do so that, A, this is like extremely rudimentary and he's motioning towards grounds for the concept. But I don't know. I mean, you know, the, the movement kind of like started off of this. Of course. I'm not saying it's not worthwhile to publish this, but it's not what mm. I expected based on like you had having told me that this is kind of like the foundational work of that, you know, field, I guess. True. Uh, it, so I, I, and I, I that think, was, I think that was, that was the expectation primarily, but also going through it, the turns that it made also um, kind of betrayed my expectations. Okay. Okay. So those are the two fronts. And, and I do agree that like you would never expect like in a foundational paper, for the author to like lay out and just hedge all, you know. Um, <laughs> and just, if, like, you, just, if you think this okay, is an issue, then. <laughs> exactly. And just, just address all concerns and lay out just some brilliant, you know, thesis essentially of how everything can be addressed. Like I didn't expect that, of course. And yeah, um, yeah. it would be totally unfair to. But I think there are prescriptions, mm-hmm. you know, at, at, at the back of the paper that just kind of like, yeah. I, I love the concept, I think. But once... See, I don't even the, know if I love the concept, to be honest. I think I do. I think I do. We can get into that. So, but, so let, me throw, let me throw a GIF in a bone, though, and admit that GIF, and if I were to anonymize this and submit it to a philosophy journal with this many citations and this loose of... It, would just, it probably wouldn't get accepted. So I don't think it could be published. Like I mean, It's a criminology journal, obviously. Right. But, but I, that's also not to degrade criminology. That wasn't... That no, wasn't no, no. I, I understand. They might have different... Um, <laughs> acceptances for like lower i mean just it's really just a lower, that was a jab <laughs> um i was gonna say like lower um well, well, actually, I also, kind of, it has to be a jab but it's like the lower kind of strictness with citations and like that you referenced well, and also I, just kind of like the tone was was different I, I just think that this was probably such a budding field and budding idea at the time that there probably wasn't a lot of ground already tread that's also, true like, you know that's that must be the case it's kind of just looking back you know 50 years and it's like you can see a little bit of like that age and the kind of expectations might have been a little bit different. Um, you can also get by with sloppy writing if your idea is like novel enough. I mean, it's like, that's true. It, it wasn't, it wasn't it, like, I mean, well, it sounds but, but, like but, he's but, like not necessarily. Point, oh yeah, go ahead. Sorry. But like the point I want to make is this though. Like, I mean, I know that like, if you listen to, you know, political philosophers um, speak of like Rawls, right. Yeah. They all complain that Rawls is an especially bad writer. Yet Rawls, you know, kind of revolutionized the field yeah. like in the 20th century. So it's like, I think you can, you, if your idea is novel enough and interesting enough, the writing kind of takes like, you, you can know, drag it along. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It takes a backseat because the idea kind of yeah. is front and center. So no, I mean, that's totally acceptable. And I don't want to disparage like the work in just inherently. It was just, again, it was mostly the difference between the expectations um, that I wanted to lay out. Um, if, if you think one, Rawls is bad, we'll just read like one passage from Kant at some point on the, on the podcast. Sorry, Giff, what were you going to say? Oh, um, I was going to say we can get into it, but I wanted to point out in the getting into it, one of the lines that kind of caught my attention as just striking. Um, so this is just on the second page. Um, I guess this isn't skipping any content or anything. We can go back, but it says, my personal knowledge when it comes to British courts is limited indeed. And I'm like, what a crazy thing to just lay out. Well, <laughs> but you also have to, uh, this this was a Scandinavian writer in a Scandinavian yes. journal. So Norway, was, right? No, it's, a, it's a British journal. Oslo. It's the British Journal of Criminology. He's, yeah, so this is so I think he, from Norway. Oh, yeah. okay. So, but, but I, yeah, okay, fair enough. So it's within the British Journal of Criminology. He's like, I have very scant experience or knowledge and I have vague childhood memories. I'm like, okay. <laughs> like, I, again, it, it, it doesn't necessarily mean the ideas are flawed, but it's like, you didn't think to like do a little bit of like research, like wander into a court one day before you to, write to, this? To actually, again. to defend Christy though on that, I don't think you would need that to lay out the ideas in this paper. Like, I think that these conceptually stand. I don't, I don't know. I don't, I, well, uh, we, can, yeah, we can go through it and then like, I may I think, reconsider, I think that, I think but it was that, just striking that, to me reading through it the first time. I think that criticism is actually probably fair for half of the problems. Okay. But let's, so let's yeah, get please, into Let's it. get in. Okay. I would summarize this paper as saying, <clears throat> basically the author is pointing out a problem with sort of 
alienation or isolation or depersonalization within the what I have to assume <clears throat> is common between Scandinavian and British and U.S. criminal justice systems. Um, and pointing out that those issues um, leads Nils to put forth this kind of revolutionary idea as uh, uh, conflicts as property. And <clears throat> using that, I, the term restorative justice isn't ever used in this paper, but people, I don't know who actually coined that, but there's been sort of a, a, a large and burgeoning movement of this where people have used that idea of concepts as property to redefine and kind of recreate <clears throat> aspects of the criminal justice system, uh, specifically for sentencing and sort of conflict mitigation. Yeah, not just in, in practice as well. Like oh, oh, one of the oh, supplementals yeah. you yeah. sent um, specified like a Colorado mm -hmm. kind of um, policy implemented. Yeah, yeah. So, the so and, and also like 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 with regard to like the depersonalization and the isolation, I think the author also identifies conflict as an especially personalized yes. experience. Where and, and by kind of like removing that from society and from just general behavior we're further kind of depersonalizing society. So yeah. yeah, so that's kind of what's going on there. Yeah. And I guess if I think it would do people a lot of good if it's like a four minute video, it's the shorter one that I linked to. Um, if people could just watch that first, that'll give you a really good idea of where this theory has kind of ended up in practice because that video is a couple years old. Um, it was like the, the animated one that I sent you guys. I don't remember what organization made it but like but that's kind of where where this has ended up um where it's it's basically become instantiated as a practice of of victims and their offenders kind of getting together um with it, within uh a, a, a very kind of you know restricted and confined situation like this isn't just you know you meet at like a coffee shop or something and um, they determine, you know, through kind of exchanges of reactive attitudes, um, how best to resolve what the victim or what the, what the offender did to the victim and kind of how, how they can right that wrong in a more personalized way. I think that's kind of maybe the best way I can generally describe it. Um, yeah. And there's, it is kind of like just a, an airing of grievances yeah. that, that need to be acknowledged by the perpetrator. Yeah, the interpersonal like, connection was kind of key. Like yeah. it was really one of the pillars, not just kind of like a secondary thing. Yeah. As, well, as is made evident by kind of like the one of the introduction um, and a big examples. And a, and a big thrust of the paper and where it's developed into practice is supposed to be returning conflict resolution to the more organic way it always had been done. Um, kind of pre-enlightenment-ish um so okay I, I guess we can i guess we'll kind of move through the paper a little bit systematically i mean you know we could just feel free to jump around with whatever but yeah um so i i thought i don't know it i, I, I might skip i mean you know he he kind of starts off with that tanzania example of there was like this conflict in a, in a very um, hunter gatherer society. And he, he thought that it was interesting that five elements of the conflict res resolution were, were present. Um, and did you guys find those interesting worthwhile to talk about? I found them completely confusing when I first I, got uh, there. I was like, where on earth is this going? His first <laughs> sentence is like so controversial and like, confusing and he goes into like a narrative which i didn't find very informative he seems to use like narrative devices a lot which i'm not a huge fan of um but this example like i don't know that he even uses that to structure kind of his like um yeah theory. Know, it's kind of like why. he observed <laughs> I, five things and then kind of drops that yeah i i actually found it like a very poor example to be honest because the uh, thing yeah, is like yeah. because because the thing is i think he's trying to make this point explicitly for criminal cases mm right which is the this hardest is, case yeah. That, that, yeah that's that's the hard case exactly but this is a civil case 
even in the yeah. United States. Like, so, yeah. you know yeah. what I mean? Like this, like the, 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 the uh, Tanzania mm. example where, you know, there's a man and a woman and the woman, you know, it's just a engaged. divorce essentially. Yeah. yeah. Well, they're, they're, they've been engaged and he invested a lot of money, but she wants to break the engagement. How do they, you know, kind of rectify the situation mm. and return yeah. payments to the man who invested in the relationship? Yeah. Fine, it seems to be not just but, expenses, but kind of some sort of like community acceptance which I think is important for like the later paper yeah. Um, that he kind of explains, but that's basically it. Like the five points are not structured to like methodically take it down. in like the next section, it's just kind of like an example and observations. I will say this, this is a point very kind of amenable to what you were saying earlier, Giff. And I, I did honestly find that there were some portions of this, which were, almost disconnected from what I took the cent- central thesis to be. Like there were some sections of paper where I was like, mm, I'm, I'm failing to see how this connects, like especially well. Yeah. And this was one of them. So, so let's just move past it. Yeah, of course. We can get to the ideas if the <clears throat> structure isn't the, you know, <laughs> the most important pieces. Yeah. Okay. So on page three of the PDF, um, so he, th- this, is, <clears throat> he, this is kind of the beginning of the core of what he's talking about. So he says, uh, courts are not central elements in the daily life of our citizens, but peripheral in four major ways. So the first is that, so the first and second I didn't get at all. For the first is that they are situated in the administrative centers of towns outside the territories of ordinary people. And the second is within these centers, they are often centralized within one or two large buildings of considerable complexity. And he talks about how like even lawyers can lose their way. I I (laughs) really absurd to me at first. I really failed to see how that mattered at all. The first one seems to be the first one seems to be good. The first one seems to be like a fair point, considering I mean we don't have to go we we don't well hang on, let me make my point here. But so like I mean, think about sort of infamous cases that even have, have happened in our town, right? What if the trial took place in our town, right? I mean, you might actually be inclined to go. There might be more communal participation in an event that occurred in our town. So if if the thesis here is to kind of further the idea of not just a victim-focused sense of justice, but more of like a communal sense of justice, Mm -hmm. then proximity does matter, I think. And that's true. I'm just kind of realized as you said that, that in fact, we actually kind of view the proximity as a bad thing explicitly. I mean, in some of the major cases that we've seen recently in the US, um, they had to go outside of the county to even find like a um, court that wasn't heavily biased. Well, maybe not outside the county, outside the town, um, because everyone was so like aware of the case and had a pre-existing like opinions mm. and knew people that they had to find like an unbiased sele- jury selection elsewhere. So that, so, well, yes, so, that, so that was the constructed jury, but for people to just witness the right. event, though, I, mm. I think I understand the point being made here. Um, no, I think that's fair. I, it just kind of like came to me as you said that. Um, I think that's fair enough, but it seems to me like the first point is seem it might be a relic of Norway at the time. I don't know how rural it was, but outside the territories of ordinary people doesn't necessarily didn't ring as true to me. You know, actually, the point that Adam made is making me think that it's important to emphasize again, everything that we're talking about here is for the is for the the sentencing and the resolution portions. It's not none of this has anything to do with determining whether the person is causally responsible or culpable for the crime. That is true. Because like, because I think that that is like a really I don't I, I mean, I don't know what's kind of holding restorative justice back, but I have to think that people being confused about what exactly it's supposed to replace is a is a big issue. That's true. He mentioned later kind of like what he's addressing isn't just purely to met out guilt. You know? Yes. Yes. So I think that is a good point to make. And, and, um, and it's and it's very loose, the structure here. Yeah. But like kind of based on the things we touched on earlier, where it's about sort of eliminating the depersonalization. Yeah, I think proximity in this case here is a factor in that to point out you know what i mean so so whether you agree with that that or not yes whether you agree with that or not you're like actually i I in fact don't think we should have that well then you disagree with the thesis you know what i mean of kind of of eliminating some of those barriers Hmm. but it is worth it's not arbitrary to mention that as the first point you're right yeah i I think i think it's a fair point Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I yeah, yeah, okay. So I, I I'm reading that point now as this is sort of a necessary it seems to be an instrumental good. Like it's it's good in that it 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 allows for more community engagement and that's the thing that we're trying to reach more. Yes. Right. <clears throat> yes. Okay. And I and I even see that with part 2 here where I mean just to kind of summarize part 2, there's a certain austerity to our courthouses mm. currently and I mean, there's a lot of truth in that to the point where, honestly, it's, it's quite scary, actually. Um, you know, I, like I've been to the courthouse here in Pittsburgh several times. I, I just is, went to a dispute a parking ticket not that long ago. It, yeah. It's, it's, it's kind of scary to walk into some of those rooms. And if you've never been, if you're unfamiliar with court <clears throat> proceedings, walking into a courtroom. Oh, it, I, was, I was totally like jarred. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So it's, it's, it's austere. I mean, there's no other word to describe it. So no. it's, so there's a certain environment that doesn't really contribute to a community oriented kind mm-hmm. of system of justice here. So that, that is a point to bring up. And that that's directly speaking to the third element that, that Christy addresses, uh, He says, this impression is strengthened when you enter the courtroom itself, if you are lucky enough to find your way to it. Here again, the periphery of the parties is the striking observation. The parties are represented, and it is these representatives and the judges and the judge or judges who represent, I'm sorry, who express the little activity that is activated within these rooms. So it's like he's pointing to the fact that it's done by other people. The actual, you know, uh, offenders and victims aren't necessarily really involved in it. so, and, uh, and I guess that directly leads to the fourth um, way in which it's, it's not a central element of daily life. And he says, <clears throat> um, I have not yet made any distinction between civil and criminal conflicts, but it was not by chance that the Tanzanian case was a civil one. Full participation in your own conflict presupposes elements of civil <clears throat> law. So I, so I take it by this, he's, I mean, he, I wish he was more explicit, but he's also saying like, um, like, like pirating, like pirating wouldn't fall into this because there's not like a victim there. Right. Um, or, or like my parking ticket exam, like there's no, I didn't have like, there's no victim to that offense. Right. It was just like, so so he, he's, he's kind of narrowing the range of cases that this is applicable to. Right. Yeah, he but touches but, on the criminals you, in the rest of the paragraph. Well, yeah, I'm saying there needs to be a, a both a criminal and a victim. I take it as his point here. Yeah, but even that's not made too clear because it's like I have not yet made the distinction between civil and criminal conflicts. Um, but it was not by chance that the Tanzania case was a civil one. I mean, I thought the next was, sentence was the one I was because he says full participation in your own conflict presupposes elements of civil law. I take it that elements of civil law mean that there has to be a, a offender and a victim. I, well, so, read the next wait, sentence. Wait, wait, but, but, but you but you could have in criminal law, right? Like mm-hmm. a, a perpetrator and a victim as well. No, um, I know. But, but, but yeah. I think it's the full participation aspect there, which is like you other in criminal law you don't have that mm-hmm. where it is in civil law, at least here, like in the U S um, I mean, it's, you've got like the plaintiff and the defendant mm-hmm. and you, this, the state is not, you know, like a party in the case. So unlike criminal law where. Yeah. It's um, someone the versus the state. Yeah. 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 So what so, I think he's basically laying out here is the fact that he dislikes the fact that we have a separate, to some degree, a separate kind of system in mm-hmm. which we've kind of taken away the, the you know, relevant parties and in, the state has kind of taken its place. Yeah. Um, he, yeah he's, I, he's saying, I, he says I, yeah. the Tanzanian case was a civil one to highlight the fact that that's kind of like the system in which he um, pref- like sees conflict resolution as being preferred is one which more closely resembles what we would call civil law. So it's like more of that system. I again, he doesn't really. Hey, let me um, read. Let me read another. Let me read another quote. He says, so in a modern criminal trial, two important things have happened. First, the parties are being represented. Secondly, the one party that is represented by the state, namely the victim, is so thoroughly represented that he or she 
for the most for most of the proceedings is pushed completely out of the arena, reduced to the triggerer off of the whole thing. So, okay, I, that that aligns with what we were saying um, yeah. because he's lamenting the fact that it is what well, this we'll, we'll get into this, but that the conflict has been sort of stolen from the individuals actually involved with it, and it's been outsourced to right either the state directly or representatives of the state. Yeah. And, and once again, it's, it's honestly, it's very, very convoluted here because the thing <laughs> is like th- that line still doesn't make any sense. Full participation in your own conflict presupposes elements of civil law. Yes. In Western countries, but you chose a case from an African country. Yeah. You could have possibly chosen a case that had elements of civil law in a criminal case in a different country. There, there are well, definitely no. countries in which criminal cases are treated like civil cases where you have two parties that, I mean, like it, that's a huge element of like Islamic law, right? Where it's like, like the state isn't involved in a lot of jurisdictions where you've got two parties that meet in front of a judge. Mm. And so I, I don't know why an example like that wasn't chosen. Right. Well, I, he, I think he's specifically critiquing like the Western system here and he's bringing up, you know, the fact that participation in your own conflict presupposes elements of civil law is kind of like we already kind of accept these facts that I enjoy in one aspect of like law, um, mm. but not other. I thought I you can bring up the critique here of those specific things, right? I, I understand what you're saying, but I, I still I don't think the point was made here well. Oh, no, uh, certainly not. <laughs> yeah, because because the thing is, like. They he very well could have chosen a case in a Western democracy that was a civil case and then said the exact same line, full participation in your own conflict presupposes elements of civil law. He didn't need to go to like the Tanzania example, except for the fact that there was more of a communal aspect to it. It's almost like trying to get us to invoke our like roots or something. Right. Again, it was like kind of narrative (laughs) pre-industrialization, I think was trying to be invoked here. Okay. So here's, Okay, I think another weakness of the paper is that it, and I think it might honestly be a weakness of restorative justice from what I understand about the larger practice, which is, again, it's not much, but um, he definitely could have been more clear and he doesn't do himself any favors with talking about what Because I think that he raises problems that restorative justice doesn't solve. And it has kind of no business solving. So on the next page, um, he talks about in the in the top of page four, he talks about how there's like there's a a less honorable temptation for the state or the emperor or whoever's in power to use criminal cases for personal gain and to like over punish people. And but that that to me seems like that would be an issue with the immorality of the laws more than the legal practices, right? I I take it that restorative justice, it can't really address. So like one, one thing that restorative justice can't connect with is the immorality of something like, you know, the criminalization of marijuana, right? Like that, that's an issue with immoral laws. And I think that bringing up kind of, either immoral laws or ways in which those laws can be bent by people in power is not necessarily the best way to make your case for restorative justice. Because like, he's not trying to advocate that he's not even really trying to advocate that power gets pulled from the state. I mean, there's a little bit of that, but it seems like he's more trying to advocate that the, I don't know. It's kind of like the acting out of all of that gets gets put back to the people. I, I don't know. Do you know, it's, it's a minor point, but I just, you, you got to be sharper, I think. No, I, I totally agree. I, I totally understand the conflation you're pointing out there being made um, where it's kind of like, it's, it's less of a critique of kind of like the depersonalization and more of like the potential laws that could be used. Yeah. So, yeah. So, but, and then also like in this same section, another critique, to be honest, is it's brutal. I, I it's but it's it, when you read through this, like this is my third time. Well, I agree, it, and it's like, <laughs> and it just becomes more and more evident, like the issues with it. But, but also, did you get the sense in the section here that this is like just a massive straw man 
for why we have sort of this depersonalization. He, he goes hard at lawyers in the next. Oh, this. I thought it was hilarious. But, 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 I already made note about what you guys might say. <laughs> yeah, but it's like it's like okay. As we all know, there are many honorable as well as dishonorable reasons behind this development. And this development being um, just the fact that participants in the conflict have been sort of sidelined by experts. By experts. Yeah. And, and they say, okay, the honorable ones have to do with the state's need for conflict reduction and certainly also its wishes for the protection of the victim. Those aren't the only reasons. <laughs> yeah. It, like th- those aren't the only reasons. Oftentimes, I mean, here's another one like, uh, what about the one being accused is entitled to have the best defense available to them? I was going right? to say like, fairness. Yeah. Yeah. Because like, what, what if you're just not someone who's good at making your own case? Yeah. Like, like even before, like even in front of your peers, like what if you just aren't well-versed, but you didn't do it, hmm. right? You are still entitled to someone who can speak on your behalf, hmm you know, to make that case, even if you are marginalized in the process. So you could disagree with that and say, in fact, you know, yeah. a more personal system is you know, preferential or, or, or preferred, I mean, but that is a reason why we have this, mm. right? Mm. Yeah, no, you're right. Like there, there are just huge like reasons that we have the system we have. And he kind of like in one sentence addresses like, well, there's, these are good reasons. And then he just kind of just like passes it on. It's like, you didn't really give us a really full like exploration of the system, like the whys and like what we can kind of cut off that are just kind of um, brought along just because it's of like the um, development path that we had taken and like nothing like that. It was just like, there are two good things. It is rather obvious. <laughs> so is also the less honorable temptation. And then he kind of goes on after that. It's like, you kind of missed something there. Yeah, I mean, I mean, a gift and like imagine like you had been like falsely accused of like rape or something like that, right? Okay. And now you're gonna you're gonna have to like almost address the community at large. Like there's gonna be you're not you're not just addressing like the accuser, but you're addressing the community as they all sort of like watch on, you know. And in our system, you're not required to testify. You're not required to get on the stand. You're not required to provide testimony that could incriminate you if you if you feel like that you otherwise like you could take the stand if you wanted to. Yeah. Wait, just, just you, to be fair, do, it doesn't all of this have to be about the sentencing, right? Because because what you're talking about is like providing evidence for or against yourself, but that's not necessarily in the scope. And and if he's conflating that, then that's his problem. No, no, but but the idea here is that yeah, yeah, but that you, you shouldn't have to represent yourself. Exactly. Because the thing is, like, in, in this system, you have to address your accuser, right? Well, that's I don't, so so I don't know about that. So I here's the thing. In this system, you are supposed to address your accuser. But from what I can, I mean, unless I'm conflating, like, the videos that Jordan provided with the um, uh, paper, I think the restorative justice approach is supposed to be an option. Um, yeah. which should take the burden of a lot of these cases that we currently have in our current system. But presumably, you know, I mean, it's not really addressed too much, but there would be some analogous or simply the same system as the alternative option in those cases, which you describe where clearly you don't want to be just kind of put in front of your peers, um, you know, for minutes after labeled, the yeah. sentencing. Yeah. 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 But, yeah. No, but, but I, I think, I mean, well, so can I can but, just but, just to give this question? Okay. Well, I just wanted to say in the current instantiation of of restorative justice, it, they actually go out of their way to be extremely clear. I do know this that everything is an option to participate in it, because because you could rightly say like, you know, you wouldn't want to force. I mean, think of like you know a victim of sexual assault. Like it'd be extremely immoral to force that person to confront their accuser if they were you know timid. Or, 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 or period. period, you don't even need another reason. <laughs> well, if it would just like re traumatize them, yeah, like you could just, yeah, really imagine that. So they, yeah. they, but I don't know, I don't think that Christy says that you would have to. I think that he, he might phrase it in terms of like it is a pull. Let, let me, let me read this section then toward the end okay. to sort of kind of, what, what page toward the end. Then. Um, yeah, let me find this here real fast. Okay. From what I what I read, Christy is saying is like it's it's an intrinsically p- 
powerful reason to opt for it, but I don't know that he was making the case that it should be let me re- required. Let me read this paragraph on um, page nine. Okay. It would be the second paragraph. <laughs> I have this highlighted, yeah. So let me add that I think we should do it quite independently of his wishes. It is not health control we are discussing. It is crime control. If criminals are shocked by the initial thought of close confrontation with the victim, preferably a confrontation in the very local neighborhood of one of the parties, what then? I know from recent conversations on these matters that most people sentenced are shocked. After all, they prefer distance from the victim, from neighbors, from listeners, and maybe also from their own court case through the vocabulary and the behavioral science experts who might happen to be present. They are perfectly willing to give away their property right to the conflict. So the question is more, are we willing to let them give it away? Are we willing to, are we willing to give them this easy way out? Um, so I, I don't know. I kind of, I, and, I think it, it's clarified the next paragraph here, but yeah. I definitely um, got the idea that, that Chrissy doesn't think so. Well, that, that, that is interestingly from the perspective of discussing the criminals, not the victims. So he might. Well, but that, that's what I was talking about though, right? Yeah. I'm because, just thinking. Because the idea is like if Giffen was accused, mm-hmm. they, they might say, okay, well, are we, does, does Giffen have the option of opting out? Well, actually, this seems to be after the sentencing, like after the guilt is established. So this is no longer a case. Well, of, that's what Adam's you know, saying. Do you, do you have, so would Christy want you to have the option, Giffen? You've been, you've been, you know, um, uh, found guilty. Okay. Right? Yeah. Once I've been found guilty. Because sure. <clears throat> remember, all of this is happening after the verdict. Right. Um, Adam's saying it's not clear that Christy would want, it, it seems pretty obvious or at least it should be like, I hope Christy would agree that. And the, and the movement currently does that the, um, the victim obviously has a say in whether they want to confront you. But right. from what Adam just read, it seems like Christy is kind of prima facie against the perpetrator being able to uh, refuse the, the restorative justice. I see. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know that you could convict him of that based on that alone, but he certainly he wouldn't I, be a, he wouldn't be upset with that result. Cla- clarity like. is not clarity is not exactly a strong suit of this paper. I, I think it's safe no. to say that is a good thing to bring up, Adam. I appreciate you going to that. That's yes, that's interesting. And and while we're on this, I, I actually ex- I have extremely the opposite view of the next paragraph where he says, let me be quite explicit on one point. I am not suggesting these ideas out of any particular interest in the treatment or improvement of criminals. I am not basing my reasoning on a belief that a more personalized meeting between offender and victim would lead to recid- would, would lead to reduced recidivism. Maybe it would. I think it would. Uh, I actually think that that should be a massive consideration of whether we do it. And, and part of, like I said, I have mixed feelings about this. One of the strongest pulls in the positive direction for me is, um, is that where this has been implemented, they've seen a, in Colorado, the, the, you know, one of the videos we watched, the, the lady giving the talk said that it was 90 something percent participant victim and offender satisfaction, the process and that recidivism rates dropped because of that. And, and like, if that's not a, I, I strongly disagree with Christie's like, this is not for their rehabilitation. Like w- what? I actually think that that should be a huge motivator. Yeah, I mean, he's he even says like, um... like like if this practice was ratcheting up recidivism rates, if people were like reoffending, no, that, that's not even thing. victims, but those victims, like, I would be can't <laughs> like shut it down. Shut it down. He says, <laughs> however, I would have suggested these arrangements even if it was absolutely certain they had no effects on recidivism. Maybe even if they had a negative effect, he says that like but later they, on in that same paragraph. No, I, I, there was another no. quote where I was like. What it, what what like informs your decision making here? It's, at the very end, he says we might as well react to crime according to what closely involved parties find is just and in accordance with general values in society. I'm like, okay, we might as well, <laughs> even <laughs> with, you know, um, increase yeah. recidivism. I'm like, really? There, there, it's there so is funny. there there is very much a strain of deserve going through all of this, which I really disagree with, even though. 
I, I do f- have positive views of the practice. I don't know. <clears throat> Point of huge. Oh, okay. You know what I... Okay, can, so, I, can, can I actually yeah. ask one clarifying question? Yeah. Um, yeah. I, where, where exactly in the reading here, I must have like um, kind of missed this piece. Where exactly in the reading does that, do we know that this for sure happens after um, the decision has already been made? So um, I was looking at page nine and then kind of in that paragraph that we were looking at, um, it says quite independently of wishes. This is the one you brought up. Kind of later on, it says, like, I know from recent conversations on these matters that most people sentenced are shocked. So that kind of is a, one of the main points brought up in this kind of conversation about whether criminals should have a say. I don't think that I don't think that indicates. Uh, I know from recent conversations on these matters that most people sentenced are shocked. I don't think that's um, necessarily indicating that this happens after the sentencing, though. Perhaps not. It's not how I read that. I I, 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 I kind of did for me, but again, I'm not gonna. <laughs> we need to pull this guy out of. Actually, I think he passed away, the, but we need to really. I, what I think we should do is is go through the paper under the assumption that he does mean after the sentencing, because a, the current restorative justice movement does, but b, I think the only fruitful parts of this are going to come from after the sentencing. Like we can't. Th- you know what I mean? Like I I, I think that this. This idea gets ex- way worse when it comes before the sentencing, when we're determining guilt. Determining just the facts of the matter. No, no <laughs> experts, no lawyers, just hash it out. Oh, like that. that. But, but, but doesn't, it, doesn't that seem to be sort of like the case, though? Because, like, because, I, I, okay, maybe I just read this incorrectly because, like, let me give a point to yeah, another point here. I mean, I don't have to get like specific lines, but there's a section here where he talks about introducing evidence that the participants themselves find relevant, right? Things like hearsay and um, just other forms of testimony. Can you find this? Oh, so, so I know that, well, this is not the exact point, but he, this is in the same vein. He also says on the top of page five, another is concentrated attention given to those attributes in the criminal's background, which the healer is particularly trained to handle. This is, this is, this is a very Strassonian point. Like he says, biological defects are perfect. So also are personality defects when they're established far enough back in time. And he's saying that he should, uh, or, or rather we should, um, th- th- this, this I thought was almost an incoherent point by him because he's saying like, um, these are bad things to include in the sentencing because they take away from the attention given to the victim. But presumably in these reactive exchanges, um, and this came out in the videos, like those things would come up, right? It's like, so I thought that that was an almost incoherent point by him. He's saying like, we should, we should not focus on the particulars of the, of the offender. Like, you know, whether he was, uh, biological defects whether he had schizophrenia or something right but but what if like that that seems like it would be a central feature of you know like i i'm so like i'm so sorry i did this to you my my doctor had a stroke and i was unable to get my prescription refilled or something but like right in this in this like you know what i did to you happened while i didn't have my bipolar medication or something right like that that seems like an obviously relevant detail yeah I don't know. I, I, I read this entirely different than you guys. I mean, what about the section where it's like, we should, we could potentially do it with judges. Wait, wait, where is you this? this? The yeah, like, wait, 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 wait. Okay, okay. Where is this? Where is this? okay, okay. I mean, like, okay, I have to at least find that one. Um, See, okay, maybe I go ahead and find it. it. So, so I think I'll... you got, I think I'm starting to think I'm, I read this right here. Cause like, cause that, that line alone there where it's um well i i might i might plead for my let's look at this as after the sentencing because before it's it's this is madness if this is all happening before. <laughs> okay so what, what, what this section on page 11 here page 11. Okay. Yes, sir. so about uh, halfway through the page so the idea is clear it ought to be a court of equals representing themselves 
when they are able to find a solution between themselves, no judges are needed. When they are not, the judges ought to also be their equals. Maybe the judge would be the easiest to replace. If we made a serious attempt to bring our present courts nearer to this model of lay orientation, we have laid judges already in principle, but that is a far cry from reality is what we have, blah, 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 blah. And then should lawyers be admitted to court? Ultimately, the answer is no, there is. Well, so I, I, do, I don't think that this is like an after the fact idea. This is like lay people <sighs> acting as judges. And there is some sort of mediator that is a lay person. And people can provide evidence. There's a section, like I said, where people can provide evidence that, that, that they find relevant. There is essentially a gallery of their peers witnessing this in a neighborhood of which they like, of which the act occurred. That's how I'm reading this. If, if, so. he, <laughs> if, if, if he thinks that all of this is a prescription that he's talking about during the verdict discussion, I, I no, no, <laughs> not. The this, lay judges. This is one of the worst ideas I've ever heard if that's what he's talking about. I, I was giving it, I was reading it through my lens of knowing how the practice is instantiated today. So, so this is all after the sentencing. He is no, gravely good... unclear at best. <laughs> no, I agree. He's unclear. Honestly, like I had no pre- like pre knowledge like Jordan had, um, but I also didn't read it the way Adam did. Honestly, in this section, like the lay oriented court, I was distracted just by the boldness of some of these claims. Like <laughs> specialization in conflict resolution is the major enemy. This, this, that, that alone is a like bold, big X. Yes. Dude, I like I actually made a note because so Adam Smith in the Wealth of Nations, that is like one of the main points that he brings up is like like the vision of labor and specialization is what drives like in, dis- in like progress. And this guy is just like specialization is the enemy. <laughs> like, well, but but, but, to be but, fair, but in yeah. the context of this, the yeah. point's a little bit different though. though. But 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 the thing is, but right. do you guys agree with me now though? It's titled a lay oriented court where you replace the judge. Here's what I'll say. All of what you read is compatible with both versions, the reasonable and the insane version. How is it compatible? How you're replacing the judge? Well, if you're talking about if if you're talking about in sentencing where the two parties reach a resolution that remember so there was a um there was I don't remember where this was, but he said if two parties reached <clears throat> a conclusion but the conclusion didn't meet some sort of pre-established threshold of punishment, then the judge would add on additional punishment. So I I think that that could be read. Okay, imagine this. Imagine that he says, after the verdict has been reached, comma, and then says all of this. Do you know what I mean? Because judges are obviously involved in like the sentencing. Um, So... Because, because for, right, like I think this is going to be a short episode. Like this, is, this is this is madness if this happens before. I think we can all agree on that, right? I, I think it definitely happens before here. I mean, no, but what I'm saying is, it, it for the fruitful version of this, which is the current day version, it only happens after the fact. Which yeah. then I think it there are still huge problems, but it becomes a more interesting discussion. Yeah. Right. So, so I'm just saying, let's provide like a big bracket as if he were more clear <laughs> about this being yeah. after. I'm, yeah, I'm just saying, I mean, it, the, no, I'm the, whole, the, yeah. the whole point of the paper is that our current court system, it's like, I know, it, I know, I know. Is, the the so, language is loose as a goose. <laughs> it's yeah. very hard to find the author's voice versus like the author presenting something he doesn't like. It is like critiquing that yeah. versus just kind of like just a straight observation that was kind of like pen to paper wrote and then never critiqued whether or not it should be included. Pen to paper. You know, can, can, I, can I circle back and say, I, I wanted to say, because so far we, we have focused on the parts that we don't like. One part that I really liked is his, his diagnosis of a lot of the issues. And, and you know, I was actually uh, not, not really a page. Um, well, I guess it, I guess it kind of happens t- towards five. It's like between four five and six. I mean, this was more of a general point. Oh, okay. Please continue. I, I really liked his diagnosis of, I think, I, I'm, I think you guys would agree with this, but it seems like 
I can't, I mean, this is all the more true in 2021 than it was in like 1977 or whatever, but don't, haven't you guys noticed there's an increasing impulse to immediately take issues to a higher authority rather than work them out yourselves. And, and I think that this happens like, you know, I was kind of, I was kind of thinking about this. If you think about a spectrum of interpersonal disputes within an organization, say a university or a, or a, uh, an, an employer or a nonprofit, you know, just an organization. Then in the middle, you have civil cases. And then at the far end, you have criminal cases. I think that this, the idea of conflicts as property is the most germane and most beneficial in the interpersonal cases of an organization or in a, in a university or something. And it needs the least amount of or the lowest amount of supports, scaffolding, bracketing, that kind of stuff. And those two things reverse as you go to a criminal case. So I think that this becomes more and more problematic as you get to a criminal case. But think about, think, think about like, um, Adam, do you remember we were discussing, uh, Brian and I were really discussing a lot of the issues that we had with the resident assistant roles at Pitt? Yeah. We were talking about that. One of our biggest issues is that the entire way that conflicts are resolved in the university housing system is extremely infantilizing and dehumanizing in the way that Christy points out. Because like we are like when we were being trained for an R to be an RA, there was encouragement to say the least to immediately every little thing just got escalated to like higher levels immediately there was no emphasis put on actually like restorative justice there was no there was no emphasis put on people owning the conflicts as their property it was actually like when when i looked at it through that lens i thought that this was really interesting Mm. um and and like also i don't know think about it uh, i don't know if I, don't, I haven't talked like a whole lot about this book with you guys but um jonathan height and greg lukianoff have that kind of recent book the coddling of the american mind mm-hmm. and and they it's like a really it's like a really balanced and measured book and one of the things they talk about is this impulse to uh like everything is immediately like just report Right. Like if there's like a like a conflict, like there's a microaggression or whatever, you just immediately report someone. You don't actually like talk to the person and express how this made them feel. And th- this this was remember, he talked about one of the benefits of this is um, the the reaffirming of norms. I, I think that this if you give me this and say this is how university disputes should be looked at or, you know, like or or issues within you know, your work or your employment, just like, I, I begin to love this idea. What do you guys think about it through that lens? Yeah. I mean, it makes sense to me. I, I think it still works within civil procedure. So if, if, if you yeah. have some, you know, um, complaint about, you know, a coworker or mm-hmm. just someone within the organization that you described, yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, it should be handled between those people. It shouldn't be yeah. brought to an authority where it's there's like this entire depersonalized kind of court in session to yeah. kind yeah. of meet out punishment. So yeah, that makes sense. And I agree with Jordan. Like the observation doesn't need to be true that it's kind of like the instinctual reaction, right? Mm. It's not like, well, I, you know, I, I made several measures <laughs> in order to like reach out to that person and try to explain my case. It's like, it's like, well, there was a conflict and this body is the yeah. one who should you know resolve have you the have you guys ever reported someone like that in your life i never have i have no impulse towards that thing no like obviously if someone committed a crime you know, that's a different issue but like it's like i've never <laughs> <laughs> i've witnessed many a crime never, <laughs> never reported a one no but like i i don't know i i actually do like kind of viewing this through that lens of like, I, I actually do kind of think we're really weakening people's abilities to resolve conflict as their own property. Yeah, no, I agree with that. Like when we were, I don't know, like when we were, um, when we were like, you know, growing up in school, I, it was like, 
there, it was very dishonorable to kind of take a dispute to like the teacher. The <laughs> principal. <laughs> the invocation of honor there is like it is extremely dishonorable. Right? <laughs> he he comments on honors explicitly somewhere. I don't remember exactly where. It's so <laughs> funny because it's so true. Isn't it like the perfect? You're, 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 you're like the biggest rat in the world. You like, <laughs> yes. Took it to like it's like I've I've alerted the principle of this behavior. Like oh my goodness, <laughs> like it it betrays it betrays like a weakness really it, it, like an interpersonal weakness. And the thing is, is that when you outsource all of it, it doesn't allow, it doesn't, you know, it's like a muscle. You have to actually yeah. exercise it to improve. Atrophy is the result, naturally. <sighs> so like, uh, to, I, thought, I thought that he was, I thought that he was pretty astute at diagnosing a lot of the problems. Um, Did you guys... Uh look into the application of restorative justice with regard to uh, the Rwandan genocide? No, no. Okay. So I looked into that. So, so the little background with that, I'll, I'll kind of keep it a little bit vague um, just because some of the terminology I don't know as well, but pretty much like the population is like around 10 million and uh, 1.2 million of the people were involved in the genocide, oh either carrying it out or like we're accomplices, right? So it, it just wasn't feasible. You can't jail to, a tenth of the population. Yeah. You can't. You yeah. can't. No. So as a result of that, they kind of like implemented like um, thousands. Oh, I have of, heard of this a little bit, actually. Yeah, yeah, like thousands of courts where there were P- obviously. Weren't they called um, truth and reconciliation courts? Um they they actually had like a very kind of like okay. specific native name actually oh okay yeah yeah that specific I, and I, so i don't i don't remember the name but okay. um but either way um they they did meet out punishment so there was sort of like a rich ret- like retributive justice involved there hmm. but there was also just a huge element of restorative justice where they got individuals together honestly and allowed yeah. victims to air grievances to these perpetrators in a, in a community setting. Hmm. Um, and kind of, that was a big part of the justice there because you can't, you can't jail a 10th of the population. Yeah. So yeah, I thought that was pretty interesting. That is very interesting. It Correct me if I'm wrong. Well, this wasn't this, I didn't get a lot of this from the paper, but it seems congruent with the paper. Well, I guess it was in the paper a little bit. It, it seems like also, th- so the restorative justice obviously includes punishments for civil and criminal crimes, but what it does, this is, okay, here's, I have a lot of mixed feelings about this because there's obviously an, a, 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 an, there's an obvious good in allowing the restitution to be personalized, right? Because- if the same crime was committed to two different people by two different people, the way that that crime would be perfectly restored or that person's life would be restored is going to look different, obviously, right? Because like if Adam has an iPad and I have an iPad and Adam's just has, you know, Netflix and <laughs> porn on it. <laughs> it's just, just, just those things. Just, just, <laughs> Just those two things. <laughs> uh, yeah, Adam's iPad is for pure, just like it's just it's just a filthy place. <laughs> yeah. But mine, I use it as my work computer, right? Like I have like a like a, a, a an extendable keyboard for it and everything. It's a way different deal if both of those iPads are stolen, right? Because Adam has to log. It's back a much bigger deal his- for me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> The restoration process is going to be lengthy. Yeah, <laughs> it's going to Adam's Adam's restorative justice is going to be refilming all of those. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> so, <laughs> we we have reached an impasse. We, Adam says, we, yeah. <laughs> "Can I just pay for the iPad?" No. <laughs> I, Send it to the judge. <laughs> I can only be restored with your execution. <laughs> <Just> like, <laughs> So for like, I, I take it that, I don't know, like it, so the, so the way in which restorative justice allows you to personalize the restitution seems to be a good thing, right? But here's where I'm worried. 
I guess the concern that hasn't been addressed at all by this paper and actually at all by the videos is, is bias, I guess you would call it. So like, I take it that a strength of our criminal justice system, at least in theory, if not in practice, because I know in practice it doesn't work, right? But like, it's supposed to be completely impartial. So your race, for instance, should not, in theory, because it probably does in practice, but your race shouldn't factor into your sentencing from a judge in our current system, right? But <clears throat> what, what if like, you know, what if you're a black person and you commit a crime against a white person and that white person happens to be like, not even just implicitly, but explicitly racist, right? And they're like, no, th this person should, you know, th th they're just going way outside the limit of what's reasonable. Yeah. So, <sighs> because, so the way that the current system is formatted today is I think that there are minimums and maximums for different crimes, right? But what happens is within those mins and maxes, the conversation between the victim and the perpetrator can attenuate that to a, to a degree. So for instance, if like, if, if, um, if it was theft, right, <clears throat> this was, this was an example in the video, if your iPad was stolen and <clears throat> the criminal can do a lot of work to try to get it back, that might be a reason to reduce the sentencing a little bit, right? But what if the what if the what if the victim was extremely racist and they just they were like they got their iPad back and then they're like the maximum time this person like I'm not going to be happy unless this person gets the maximum time. Would that happen after? Well, because well, it's not clear I, that it's not. I thought the restoration itself was kind of like. In some ways, replacing the sentencing itself, I think it's supposed to supplement it. I, I don't think it's, I think it would, I think it would, that would be even a worse problem. Well, not, not, uh, okay. Yeah. I, I don't mean like there would be no, um, but rather it ought to, in many cases, replace at least some of, or the majority of, um, but the, I guess that's what, be, well, that's what I was kind of saying, right. Is like, what if like, you, you know what I mean? Meaning both would be determined congruently as opposed to like, you know, the restoration happens. And then, cause I mean, in your yeah. case that you described, it's like, well, that, that is clearly flawed. Um, Ah, like I want I, you to like spend weeks getting my iPad back. Adam says he's like, okay, well, I, I did it. Like I hope we can put this aside. Adam's like, death penalty or or bust. Like, yeah. what do you mean? Or bust? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Adam's like bust. <laughs> oh, man. oh no! Death penalty. Or... <laughs> I'll choose the latter. <laughs> I mean, I, I think that's where also like the communal aspect comes in, where it's like mm. this isn't just like an isolation. This is mm. in front of like a community, and there's also <laughs> some some form of mediator there as well. Yeah, yeah. So I I think that all kind of comes into play in terms of the sentencing. I think the problem with Christie's advocation, though, is that he wants it to all be local, non-experts. So you just get a racist town, and you'll have. That's a... what I was thinking. But too. also, yeah. like, yeah. he doesn't really yeah. elaborate. He doesn't. I mean, he doesn't elaborate on many of the things that we, you know, even our first reactions mm. um, that would bring up. But like, this would involve not sometimes, you know, not within a community, but between communities, and that alone yeah. is kind of yeah. kind of pulls at the concept. Um, he mentions earlier some like you know, generalized values. I'm like, you're not going to get very many generalized values between disparate communities. Yeah, and this, the whole thing. Is, I mean, his his outlook. I I don't know his philosophy fully, but he seems to be like almost anarchist in his anti-statism. Um, he has an he, extreme anti-expert like thread going through this, which I also very that, disagree with. There are yeah. several of those, um, but like the anti-statist one especially is like. It seems incongruent with just any modern society, like the, yes. the execution that he's referring to. He makes assumptions that seem to me from the beginning to be kind of like informed by growing up in like rural Norway. <laughs> like, I, that kind of like bleeds through. It's like um, as like kind of his perspective, you know, and he even admits like, you know, I have very limited knowledge of the British court system and like, let alone the American system. Don't it's ask like, me what side of the war I fought on. <laughs> <laughs> 
these things like clearly <laughs> break apart if you just imagine like like okay imagine someone from like you know california like drives into like one of like the you know rural states in the u.s like what the concept of community here um it's kind of hard to parse. Like, do, what are the representatives of these cases? Like, the families, yeah. perhaps, are involved? Giffen, that's actually a fantastic point there. Yeah, I mean, I, I, it, it, I, yeah, I am like, community, you're, this is going to be in front of a community you're not a part yeah. of. I mean, there's there's no the way that's going to be fair and balanced. Yeah, the so. worst, I mean, even if you have, like, the situation, like, in a Tanzania case where both parties are represented, it's like, who represents the, like, the California dude? Like, just three random Californians? Just, like, it has to be family? Like, I, yeah. and the worst part about it is, is, like, the... I mean, you know, you can debate whether this is actually good or bad, but I'm imagining like the, if you kind of implement this, like in his view, you kind of have like a tearing apart of the large kind of community, which is what we consider the United States, right? There's sub communities, of course, within there, but like he does, he just does not care at all about the state, it seems. And so he, you can just imagine that like we would go from kind of like a large, you know, diverse nation with some shared values. Um, down to like just very very small sub communities, mm. um, like in practice, and it seems to me that 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 it pulls against our intuitions. I think, but he just you know doesn't have a care in the world for it. <laughs> I, I, there, there's a way in which like I don't know. I'm kind of trying to. I don't really have this thought fully formed, but yeah. Ah, uh, there, there's. There's something that I don't like about it's weird, right? Because, okay, look, if, if, if this restorative option or or this restorative justice is an option that if both parties sign up for, they can participate in and in doing so, it will naturally tend to reduce the sentences given based on both of the wishes of the victims and also sort of the judge's input based on the outcome of the resolution, right? Because you could imagine, you know, you engage in a sort of process and the offender just spits in the face of the victim. Like, I don't, you know, like, okay, that's not going to be attenuated at all, obviously, right? Then there's another one in which after days of conversation and mitigation and apologies, right, they actually search for a way to right this wrong. And the victim and the offender both come up with a partial restitution. And then based off of that, you know, the judge okays on, you know, just in our system, this crime would have been a 15 year sentence. Now it goes down to 18 months or something based on like these. So you would, I'm assuming also you would probably fulfill the restitution and then serve the time. Right. Uh, That would be the natural order. In my mind, I thought honestly, I think that's up in yeah. the air. Like the the actual um, the details aren't between the people. Out, yeah. I mean, yeah. he doesn't really comment on it at all. See, yeah. What we need is like the follow up landmark paper to this concept. Yeah, like, the one with like a similar number of like citations, but coherent and addressing points that we I, would. You know, I know. Even our first intuitions come up, and it's just like not addressed. Some papers, I know like, there is a. Need, um... You think of things, and it, it like the author predicts what you were going to th- say and addresses those points. This is Wolf, like the opposite. Wolf was my number one example of that. Yeah. Um, okay, I, I know I have um, uh, uh, on my phone. Oh, I, I really hope that I saved it. There was one, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a chapter of an edited volume. Here it is. Chapter eight of this Cambridge core um, edited volume, reactive attitudes and second personal addresses. This is supposed to be, um, <clears throat> I, I don't, let me just read the introduction. Resenting a colleague's unfair treatment of you, feeling hurt by a lover's oversight or guilt about shirking an obligation, experiencing indignation of an official's abuse of office, contempt for another's... Okay, more examples. Uh, They are joined by a more attractive group of sentiments, attentive to the right and the good, pride and sacrifice one makes for another, gratitude for a favor granted, and certain forms of love. I don't know that this at all speaks to restorative justice. I heard a discussion of this in the context of restorative justice, but maybe I'll have to look into this if it actually directly discusses it. Um, Cause I'm not, I'm not sure, but, but yeah, 
it, this this would be interesting to like read a more recent follow up of this because what I, what I I don't know what I was saying is that like if you tell me if I believe the stats which I do that this results in more victim and offender satisfaction the process and it leads to reduced sentences and it leads to reduced recidivism i'm really on board for this being an option how can you not be like it yes. was just like a three minute video from like the colorado case which it seems more of an advertisement it looks so promising how can you not be for this but yes. like th- this is another thing that i was talking about at the beginning about the expectation is you don't really get that sense from this paper no and here's i know also it's the like, result of like years and years like decades yeah. in fact of like kind of um discussion on this and like the creation of this as a kind of subject itself um but nevertheless a a lot of this in my mind actually just comes down to the empirical reality of just how this plays out i think yeah which is frustrating because he seems to care care little for it it's it's the inherently (laughs) good whether it you know increases recidivism yeah yeah he he has a very sort of deontological view of this which i just i very much disagree with well, I, I think I think the analysis is based on the consequences, but more in a loose sense, based on the the effect it has on the victim or the victim. Yes, yes. So, so you know, more practical consequences, such as reducing recidivism, or you know, just um, you know, reducing sentence times, as you mentioned, mm. more practical, sir, you know, concerns be damned and more, you know, focusing on just mm. the effect it has on the psyche of the victims. Yeah. So it's yeah. Like, it's all, he's almost like presenting it should be a value, mm. but yeah. Cause it seems like, I mean, to be frank, like the idea of the conflict as property was totally foreign to me. So you, it seems like he's pitching it a perspective entirely. But you're right. I wish he would kind of engage with some of the practicality. You know what's interesting too is like I I actually think that the norm clarification aspect of this is undervalued in the paper because I'm just kind of thinking about it introspectively. And let's say let's use like a non-legal example, right? So let's say like back to the university example, right? <laughs> there's um there's like some dispute uh or or like you know some some offense was taken by by something right like the way it currently works when you just escalate it because normally okay so the person a offends person b right the way it works is person b just immediately without person a even knowing this is happening just reports the incident to someone right then that person usually would probably end up reporting it to someone else too and then it's kind of like that's the removal of the of the conflict as property that's the theft and then the sentencing just comes down and is applied to the, the offender um, in a way in which there's actually no connection to what they did in the victim, to, to the victim. It's like a, um, <laughs> it, it, it actually kind of resembles like the problem with religious punishment. It's like, it's not wrong for me to wrong you because you're another individual. It's wrong for me to wrong you because God told me not to, right? <laughs> like, it almost has that same weird parallel going on where like, I'm imagining also (laughs) that the person given the sentence doesn't feel the same level of remorse. He probably actually, it probably, he probably hates that person for what they did, like reporting (laughs) it up. Right. Whereas if you were encouraged to, when it was reported, because, okay, let's be clear. I don't, I don't think it's reasonable to assume this is like a cultural point. It would be better if people just defaulted to interpersonal exchanges, but, like in a system in which that's not the default when the offense gets reported and then this restorative practices is instantiated i think that this would work out just so much better and the victim would actually understand what was wrong and i think in the current practice it probably just re-intensifies their beliefs i i i'm actually thinking now that this does more harm than good in at least interpersonal cases if not also civil cases Like the way our current report and then punish from above system is set up. Yeah. Yeah, no, I I agree. It's a disaster. I mean, it's it's really bad. It's really bad. I just, yeah. Yeah. It's it's just infuriating. It's like, I, it's almost like in this case, if we're using with the terminology of this paper, it's almost like uh, 
conflict property theft by the victim. Yeah. They're like, yeah. they're kind of the thief in that circumstance where it's like, it's like, oh, this, this really should have just been between us. Like, yes. why did you, why did you, you know, take this and pretty much give it away? Yeah. Um, so in this case, it's, you know, theft by the victim. Well, so, I think he would probably I argue really like that. Yeah. I think he would probably argue it's theft by the institution with whether it's the state or like the system set up um, in the university. There's two thefts. There's the th- the theft by the victim is the cultural um, reaction to just send it upstairs. And then it's reaffirmed by the people who accept it upstairs. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, I would, I think that the, I, I would guess that um, the people's the- view would be that um, it's the institution that kind of bred the culture in which that's the case. I, I don't it's know all, for sure, but I would I would imagine that his invoking of like the Tanzania case was to say like this is what it ought be in the natural way of things, right? Yeah. Before the institutions were there. Yeah, yeah but it's almost like uh, if you and I like were like went fifty fifty on like a TV, <laughs> and, sure. and then so we we own the <laughs> Adam TV, just watches TV. porn on. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> Please. So I I I take that TV. Okay. And then I go and just give it uh, and sell it off to a pawn shop. Okay. Okay. Like the pawn shop is like almost like complicit in the theft. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Almost like in the same way the university is a participant by accepting mm. the conflict in that case. But it's almost like uh, to what degree is the pawn shop, you know, culpable mm. in the theft? I think there's a little like, bit of a difference between the two cases. I, I see the parallel. In I sense, see the parallel. Right? So yeah, right because because like the pawn shop, like even like their existence allows for the theft, right? Because because otherwise, who are you going to be selling it off to? And right? also, and also on like on the university level, when they reaffirm the escalation of the offense, and then just bring down a punishment, they are confirming yes, we want to rob the offender of their chance to actually be a member of this resolution oh i don't disagree with that um i what i was arguing is only that it's the institution itself from what i can gather from nil's view that is the the thief not the victim no but i think i think the way adam i'm arguing for both yeah yeah it's both and and i because because okay think about it this way like i um like I, I kind of like I wrong you in some serious but non-legal way, right? Giffen? Sure. And and you then are presented with this opportunity or, or this this kind of like this. There's this bifurcation of what you can do. You can just escalate it to some, you know, say we're at the same university. You, you yeah. report it to the uh, whatever department it would be, dean of students, right? Yeah. You in doing that, <laughs> what? What? <laughs> just t- Dean of Porn. <laughs> <laughs> He's wrong. I, he never Disgusting. Let me use the I'll TV. allow it. <laughs> yeah. the, like the dean is back. <laughs> what was he watching? <laughs> it's actually the dean's like this is actually outside of my scope. This is, this is, this is going right to the authorities, <laughs> right, right to the Fed. So. <laughs> <laughs> Gene's like, well, you know, I'm, I'm interested in helping you two boys restore some justice. <laughs> oh no! I so, lost the track of the hypothetical a bit. I, I, I wronged you, Giffen, <laughs> and, and right, you. So, okay, when you are faced with the choice to escalate it or not, you're. When I wrong you, in that moment, we're we're sharing in the property of the offense right Mm -hmm. it's both of ours half and half essentially right yeah when you escalate it you steal my half and it's almost like you're Mm -hmm. violating your own half of the conflict too and you're just pushing it upstairs to say whatever ruling because the the thing that christy points out that we actually haven't talked about is there's a real theft uh both by the victim but also from the victim right uh, I, I know. So in a discussion I listened to on restorative justice, also um, in our current U.S. system, um, sentences that were given out actually were on average far higher than what people in a restorative context would have actually wanted to be done to the to the victim. 
or I'm sorry, to the perpetrator, which is really interesting. So there's this sense in which also like, um, you know, in, in our example, like you just get expelled or whatever. And I, as the victim, I'm like, whoa, I don't want him to get expelled from the school. Like, but, but as soon as you kind of kick it upstairs, you're robbing yourself of that half too. No, I see what you're saying now. Yeah. Yeah. I, that's actually really interesting. I wonder if anyone, that'd be cool to see if anyone has um, like spun it in that direction as like, this is a better way to deal with university issues um, because it, it's actually agnostic as to what the right answer is. You could advocate on this purely in just pragmatic terms. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. I would hope in nearly half a century since the paper is published, there's a little bit of <laughs> enlightened commentary. Um, on some yeah, of the practical yeah. com. So we, I, I think we should look for something um, yeah. that addresses some of the concerns of ours or I'll at least take it reinterprets the paper. I know I was reading a book um, in defense of honor. Um, I, I think that's the title of it. It's like a kind of a trade book, but it's pretty philosophically heavy by Tamler Summers actually. Um, okay. And in there, he has an entire chapter on restorative justice. Uh, hmm. So I could, and that was, that came out a couple of years ago. So it's pretty recent. Um, yeah. That seems like a viable option. Yeah. I, I could scan the pages and we could do that as an episode maybe. Um, when I was reading this paper, he's like, here's like another area that kind of just, I was just reminded of. Um, yeah. It's, it's doesn't parallel perfectly, but uh, when you got into that accident a few years ago. Dude, you, I had a note. <laughs> I literally had a note about that. I was going to bring it up. Yeah, yeah. I, I right when I uh, oh my, that's crazy. right when I was reading this, I thought of that exactly because I know, thought you, of it too. You like rear-ended someone because of like their poor driving, but yes. and, and then you were like, okay, like it's it's not a big deal. It's actually very small, and I can I give you the money for it. Yes. yes, it's a very very small thing. But then that person took it right to the insurance company. It you know obviously once yes. the insurance company gets a hold of it. It's now thousands of dollars in yes, damage. Yes. So, it was ridiculous. Uh, yeah. It, that that is, I mean, that's a perfect example of where now I don't know that like insurance is exactly the best. Yeah. Um I yeah, way to because that's like all intertwined with like legal, but that's like a perfect example of where the societal impulse should be just to allow someone to pay for it there. I I really do. This is like my more one of my most sort of like curmudgeon views but i do think that like we really have encouraged kind of a weakness or a softness in society about that like just a lack of trust too yeah i mean it's just like that like that person like just had like no trust in people yeah like we, we really are extremely fractured as a society at this point yeah, it's like very small damage. You're like, okay, I, I, I can pay you. You called that person like that night trying to get a hold of them. They wouldn't even answer like the phone. Yes. So, so it's like if, if I was in that position myself and somebody called me and said, okay, I want to pay for this immediately. Can we do that yes. right now? Yes. Like it'd be like, okay, go see your auto, you know, whatever auto shop, get a quote. I'll pay for it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But no, they, they had bid zero trust. So yeah. yeah, I'm curious to what extent um, this is informed by like kind of the highly industrialized society we live in. I'm just curious because mm. um, that, that clearly informs um, the aspects of trust and community size clearly has a big um, impact on the practicality. So I'm just curious if there's any literature um, well, that Christy. kind of addresses you know, Christie made me think of another text I want to uh, read in this series, A Strange Labor by Marx and Engels, because he talks about how, th- I thought that this was an interesting point too by Christie, because he talks about how we view people as their role in things, not as individuals. You know, like um, you view- I, like, your- I liked that part too. I really, I liked yeah, that part, yeah. yeah. Like you view, this is like some weird dreamy eyed view of like the past or whatever. But like, I, I do feel like there was a sense in which even, even the difference between us when we were growing up, like, I just feel like, like I was friends with my neighbors. You know what I mean? Like, I just feel like that, that doesn't happen anymore. And I don't know. There's like a real kind of depersonalization in life itself. Um, 
which like Adam and you and I have talked ad nauseum about this, but like Giffen too, like I, I know that we're extremely thankful to have grown up without cell phones for the most part, without uh, like smartphones, especially, but it was just like a much more organic for lack of a better word upbringing that was kind of restorative justice. Like it was like a Mad Max version of restorative justice. You know what I mean? Like, rights r- wrongs were righted without authorities coming in and ca- unless they were the most like you know really egregious cases yeah i don't know i just i yeah i don't there there's something that i love about this paper but i also am just so hesitant about the way in which this could be done you know well you can really see that it's like an inchoate idea where it's yes, just yes. like it's it's <clears throat> it's just the beginning of it you you can see some positive ideas coming from it yeah but the idea itself in this first paper isn't that good Hmm. even though you can see the potential for it yes yes so you know an interesting one last point sorry but just kind of remarking off what giffen said I had never thought of a conflict as property either. Oh, I had never before. So, so like yeah. that whole framework is actually like, it adds a new interesting lens to kind of view this topic. Yeah. It's but, insightful. Yeah. yeah but but like I, the- <laughs> that part you could have gotten from like a two liner on Wikipedia, you know, but like he kind of, I don't know. That yeah. idea itself. Give him a little more credit. <laughs> <laughs> I, no, yeah. I mean like the, the paper included more aspect than just yeah, conflict yeah, as yeah. property, but that aspect itself, was presented kind of over several <laughs> paragraphs, which included unnecessary sentences and, you know, intuitions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I could have gotten that from a TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> the most famous. <laughs> Dude, just, I'm going to just completely rearrange my life. So it's just like the TikTok series on conflict with property. Just estranged labor, the, the, the TikTok version. Conflict with property. <laughs> show up to a conference where he's like giving this like this talk after it's over like i could have gotten that from a tiktok <laughs> <laughs> back in 1977 you remarked that instead of presenting yeah. <laughs> instead of presenting at a conference you just play like a series of tiktoks <laughs> any questions <laughs> Well, one last serious thing, and then we could probably add this. You, you know, this actually, I would have never thought of this idea. This is this is really piggybacking off of the previous series. There's a way in which, it, this sounds extremely counterintuitive, but I think that this is exactly what restorative justice is doing. It's leveraging, this, this sounds extremely implausible, but I think it actually happens. It leverages reactive attitudes in attenuating people's retributivist desires. Which is really, it's really counterintuitive because you would naturally think that reactive attitudes would motivate the, like the, the higher retri- retribution, right? But I, but I actually think that people, I, and I'm just, I'm just really armchair hypothesizing here, but I think that the reduced sentencing and the reduced recidivism and, and, the, and the higher victim satisfaction comes from, like, I think it's really easy to hate someone when you have the all of the sentencing removed from you right like you don't get to learn about the person you don't get to understand like their own struggles right like and those are very reactive attitudes that you engage in and even like even getting really mad like i I could well imagine you like you know shouting at the person like being extremely angry like how but there's a weird way in which expressing those reactive attitudes seems to from like the statistics we saw from the tedx talk attenuate people's retributivist impulses, which is really interesting. Like I, you, I wouldn't have thought about that in this I, way. I, I think it does yeah. make sense. It's a great point on your part because I hadn't really thought about it, but um, it does make sense in the sense that like in the paper, Christy kind of points out that if there's this depersonalization, you can view the perpetrator as just non-human. Yeah, yeah. Like, and, and but you, you, it becomes very clear they are a human being mm. once you're interacting with them and expressing yourself, and they in turn express their, you know, experiences that led them to, mm. you know, partake in whatever they did. So, but that does make sense. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I guess the part that you would really want to avoid the reactive attitudes in is the is the setting of the min and max. You know, like that's where you really do want to adopt the objective stance and just, you know, like how, how does this benefit or harm a society or the, or this individual person? Yeah. Yeah. All right.
Well, I think you were going to say one last thing, Giffen. It has been lost. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I cut you off. There. And, and what he said could have been found on a Wikipedia. <laughs> Nothing but a TikTok comment. It was fine. <laughs> Uh, all right well i don't know what we're gonna do next um but whatever it is i hope i hope our listeners found this enjoyable and and informative and tune in for the next one well i hope you enjoyed that episode of plato's cave um i always enjoy discussing topics with uh with these two guys so if you want to um, support the show in any way you can do so simply by sharing it. Uh, I'm hoping to get this show out to more people. Uh, and so if you want to share it on Twitter or social media, that would really help me. Uh, you can also rate it on Apple Podcasts, uh, like this video if you're watching on YouTube, or subscribe uh, via Apple Podcasts or an RSS feed. Uh, you can also discuss it on your own show and link back uh, to my website. Or you can connect me uh, with recommended guests or topics to cover. Uh, you can get in contact with me at Plato's Cave Podcast at gmail.com. Follow me on Twitter at Jordan underscore C underscore Myers. And I now have a website for my philosophy endeavors at jordanmyers.org. If you want to know a little bit more about me and my fellow co-hosts, um, as I said in the introduction, I'm a master's student in philosophy at the University of Houston. I did my undergrad at the University of Pittsburgh, where I studied mechanical engineering and philosophy. And now that I'm back at school, I'm hoping to more closely study uh, moral responsibility, free will, ethics, epistemology, and moral psychology. Those are topics that I was uh, introduced to and got really interested in in my undergrad work. So. Uh, Adam and Giffen accompanied me on this show, and Adam is uh, one of my oldest friends. We actually met in kindergarten, um, and we've been interested in philosophical topics for as long as we can remember, and in a lot of ways, it's been the basis of our friendship. Uh, Adam studied chemistry and biology at Cornell, and he is currently working at a law firm. Um, and he's especially interested in moral responsibility as well, but also law, religion, and free will. Uh, Giffen is also one of my oldest friends, and uh, we've been friends since elementary school as well. Um, Giffen studied biology and economics at RPI, and now he works in human health research. Uh, he believes that there's very interesting overlap between both of his fields of study and philosophy, and he's particularly interested in exploring political philosophy. So this series was right up his alley. Um, and with, uh, with all of that information, again, I hope that you enjoyed uh, this episode, and I hope that you get in contact with me or, or follow my work in any way that you uh, deem reasonable to do. So with that, thank you for listening.